Yeah, hello, my friends, and welcome to Faith and Reason with myself, John Henry Weston, Father Charles Moore, and Liz Yor. We are here uh, at our first live show and uh, also have a big reveal for you. Father Charles Murr is going to give us something from a Vatican insider with regard to Pope Francis that will knock your socks off. We're also gonna touch a little bit on what Pope Francis just said today, or out today for an interview, uh, is I bless two. Controversial again, going after uh, rather harshly his critics of the fiducia supplicants document he signed, allowing for blessings of same-sex couples. Uh, in addition to that, we have uh, just craziness going on in America as uh, leftists have vowed to go after conservatives in their homes and churches should Trump be elected. All that and much more on Faith and Reason as we roll right into it. Um, Liz, why don't you... Um, uh, give us a little bit of an intro. In, in fact, well, unless Father, you'd like to do this first. Let's let's have it. Let's begin with um, your story. Give us some background first, and take us right into it, if you would. You know what? Uh, could I invite us to pray? I could. <laughs> no, I'll tell you why. I'll tell, yes, we should, because we should always pray, right? But secondly, because today today is our first live broadcast. And God help me from putting my foot in my mouth. Okay, so <laughs> in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who didst instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost. Grant us in the same spirit to be truly wise and never to rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. Sede sapientia, mora per nobis. All right, let's 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 begin where you want to begin now, John Henry. Please go ahead, Father. <clears throat> we've been we've been waiting for this one. Well, I'll tell you, it's it's sort of let me just give a, a brief preface. It's sort of a, a, as the case of, of my book. A murder in the 33rd degree was when I wrote it I wrote it because I wrote it I remembered exactly what happened it was a memoir along the way after after it got uh, printed uh, a few people were angered by the fact that uh, it was just my word as to what had happened and that's well I said well that's all I had is my word uh, you know it's that's it uh, Cardinal Gagnon was a, a, de a dear personal friend of mine all of my life. I was with him almost to the point where, uh, to the day he died. I was at his funeral, went back to Montreal. Uh, and Mario Marini is the man responsible for uh, for me being a priest. And uh, I, I call him uh, jokingly the, the fourth person of the Blessed Trinity in, in my life. I mean, he was just, he was a giant in my life. And... Anyway, when I wrote that book, I wrote that book as a memoir, and then it being accused of of uh, oh, I don't know, not not making up, but of of embellishing or something. It bothered me. It bothered me very much because it, I wrote that book paying strict attention to what I could remember and exactly the way I could remember. Thank goodness, after a little bit afterwards, uh, Dr. Roberto De Mattei came forward and said, he contacted me and he said, everything that you wrote in the book is correct. I know it's correct because I too was a friend of Monsignor Mario Marini. I visited your your home up on, on Via Fratelli Bandiera and I know what he what he said, and and uh, he said, please let me. This can you imagine what a what a what a gracious man? Please let me write an introduction to your book, let it be printed with it, so I can testify to the veracity of it. I said, that's that's wonderful. Anyway, that said, this piece of news I've kept to myself for the same reason. Why? Because I don't have a second person to verify it, except that the second person, there was a second person, and that second person came to visit me last week. He was here with me, and we spoke about this, 
and about these comments. And he, I said, do you remember these things? He said, absolutely. Not only did he remember, he added to them a couple things that I had forgotten. So I said, good, now, now do me a favor and just don't die. Hang on for a while because, <laughs> <laughs> because I may need you at some later point, all right? <laughs> And he's a, he's a, a tad bit older than I am. So uh, right. anyway, so here's the deal. Uh, in before, uh, it's either, it's either 2005 or 2007. That's uh, that I can't remember exactly well, but the three of us had dinner together with Mario, this other priest and myself. And father, if you um, could just explain who is Mario Marini. Okay. Mario Marini, um, uh, I, I, I in, in again in my book Murder in the Thirty Third Degree I do a, a fair description of him. He's a man who came from Ravenna. He was born in 1936, um, and so his father uh, asked him, didn't ask him, forced him actually to get a doctorate in civil engineering at the University of Bologna. Uh, so, and hoping, hoping that that would rid him of this crazy idea of, of wanting to become a priest. Well, he got his doctorate in civil engineering and wanted to become a priest regardless. The problem was his family wouldn't support him with that. So his Bishop of Ravenna sent him to the Archdiocesan Seminary in Milan away from his family, from that, from that kind of a problem situation. It was, it was as the English say, a sticky wicket. Uh, and, the, and now he's got another problem because he's now studying in Milan, but he has no money to pay his studies. His family had plenty of money. That wasn't the problem. They wouldn't give any. So the Archbishop of Milan granted to pay all of his studies for him. And the Archbishop of Milan, uh, Milan at that time was... Giovanni Montini, right? So he paid for all of Mario Marini's studies and also his doctoral studies in Rome. Montini became Pope. And when he became Pope, he asked for uh, Mario Marini to come work in the Secretary of State. Marini thanked him very much, but he had already made a commitment to go to Mexico as a missionary for three years. And that's what he wanted to do. And the Pope said, that's fine. The Pope is uh, the Pope and, and Benelli at the same time, Monsignor Benelli. Go to Mexico, do that. Anyway, he did. He came back from Mexico to, to Rome and he began working in the Secretary of State. Mario Marini was a man of about 6'3", 6 6'4". 6 wow. Big man, very deep bass voice. I can see people who know him are smiling already. He had a, a booming voice and a uh, uh, great sense of humor, very brilliant man. Bill, uh, he also took a, a doctorate in theology at the Gregorian University. So he had two doctorates, one in civil engineering and one in theology. And uh, a man who was completely in love with the Catholic Church and with the Catholic faith. Completely. And now he was working in the Secretary of State during probably the most difficult times up to now. These la let's keep these last 11 years uh, to one side for the moment, but they were very difficult years because everyone was challenging everything. Uh, people were having a crisis in their vocation. Uh, schools were closing, hospitals were, every, the whole thing was a mess. And there were all sorts of uh, new theologies and new theological directions that came up from the Dutch church to the German church to this, that, all of these conflicts going on. Mario Marini- In the times, obviously, of Paul VI, but, but was it after the council or where are we at with regard to council? Yes, it, well, he was there for the council. Mario Marini uh, actually worked as a seminarian in, in the council. Uh, I, I, I get, what would you call it? Paid, like an ecclesiastical page boy, I guess. <laughs> But before he was ordained, and then, then he was ordained and uh, stayed in Rome to continue his doctoral studies. But he was in Rome uh, it, during, the, during the council and right after the council. 
And right after the council were the, those tumultuous years that led up to Umane Vitae. Uh, and the aftermath of Umane Vitae, Marini stayed absolutely straight as an arrow on the whole question. He defended the Pope staunchly. And this was one, this was one of the first remarks that he that he made to me <clears throat> that 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 when, when we became friends, I won't get into 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 that, but we met in 1974 when he came back from Mexico and he started working in the in the Vatican. But he said uh, he noted this and he would never criticize the Pope. He just you he just wouldn't even person even even uh, uh, privately, but he said it's very strange about Paul the sixth. Any time you defend him, he takes umbrage. Hmm. It's it, it's it's almost it's all he he almost resented that you would defend him. He said it was a, he said I've never met I've never met something like that in, in a man. Uh, he respected his enemies who attacked him, attacked him constantly, but the people who defended him, <laughs> not so. He didn't defend them. He wasn't he wasn't uh, staunch supporters of them. Anyway, uh, we were there during all of that time together. And during the 1970s, we we lived together. We moved out of the Mexican college and we moved into the Lebanese residence residence on uh, on Monte uh, on the Janiculo. Uh, via Fratelli Bandiera. God. Anyway, I'm, I'm like, you don't get old. You have more. You have more behind you than you have in front of you, and it and it gets, it's, it's something. Anyway, we lived together, and uh, we lived through a, 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 quite a few struggles. Uh, when Benelli was made Cardinal of Florence, Mario Marini got the axe mm. from Cardinal Villot because he didn't want anyone, especially Marini was very close to Benelli. He didn't want anyone reporting back to Benelli anything that was happening in the Vatican, so they got him out. They made up a story, they made up a story which was a ridiculous story, but it took about three years uh, for him to, uh, to disprove what they were saying and to get an apology and be reinstated, which he, which he was, under, under John Paul II, the, the Pope John Paul II. Uh, anyway, Marini is a man who then was working in the with Cardinal Odi in the the uh, Congregation for the Clergy, and afterwards was made Secretary of the Congregation for Divine Right, Divine Worship, and the Sacraments. So he knew. What I'm trying to tell you with all of this is Mario Marini was a man who knew everyone in the Vatican. He never, listen to this, he never went to a Vatican ceremony that I recall, <laughs> to a papal mass, to an audience, never, 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 never. Didn't want to be seen. Huh. He said, I know the vipers and the vipers I work with. I know them. He said, and you're not going to find me peacocking around <laughs> anything. He said, I'm not, that's not what I'm here for. And he, he, he was serious. He was a strong man and he meant it. Never, never participated in anything like that. Deeply religious, a man of prayer, and solid, solid priestly friends, of which I was, I'm humbled to say I was, I was one. Uh, one of the few. He didn't have a lot of friends, but he had very, very true, deep friends. So Mario Marini, uh, around, around uh, it was a little bit before 2005, was approached by a Jesuit from Argentina. And he, he became the Archbishop of, of Buenos Aires. I'm sure with Mario's, uh, with Mario's help. You have to, there's something I want to tell you too about, about Mario. He was very defensive of Mexico, parts of the United States where he knew the situations and of Latin America. He was very, very worried about the future of the church in Latin America, and rightfully so. Today, it's, it's sad to report, almost we've lost almost 50% of the Catholics in Latin America. It's, it's terrible, it's terrible. 
to Protestantism, to this, that, and the other thing. That's what he was worried about in the 70s. And he could see this happening. And he blamed an awful lot of what was happening in the church on the theology of liberation. He hated Marxism, hated Marxism. He knew Marxism inside and out and detested it. He knew communism inside and out and detested it. And he saw what was happening with through Marxism to the Catholic Church and especially in Latin America. So he had his eye on everything happening in Latin America, particularly Mexico, but also Argentina, Chile, Peru, Colombia. Uh, this Jesuit came and started visiting him. And the, the Jesuit was, was Jorge Bergoglio. Now, I can, only, I can only tell you this. From what Mario said, Bergoglio presented himself, Father Bergoglio presented himself as a very humble, pious, one of the last good Jesuits uh, who was suffering for how much he was defending the Society of Jesus and wanted to get things back on track. Well. In context, in context, you have to remember that during this time, the Jesuits also were going through an upheaval. For a while, the Pope, I can't get Paul, John Paul II, named Miles? a pro tempore uh, superior, uh, Father Dessa. Uh, and then John Paul II, for whatever reason, sort of backed away. He could have reformed them right then. He didn't. For whatever reason, he backed away. The Jesuits were left to, to, to reform themselves. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm afraid to report that uh, they, it hasn't been going too well for them. <laughs> uh, I, I think we understand that. So this Jesuit befriended Mario Marini when he went to Rome on different occasions for different things. And he was named uh, Archbishop of Buenos Aires. He continued and then Cardinal by John Paul II. And he could not, it was in all probability, I can tell you this, I don't know this for a fact, but I intuited deeply that he did not arrive at becoming the Archbishop and then Cardinal of Buenos Aires without Mario Marini's help. Marini was, was key in, in, in many men becoming Archbishops and Cardinals after Baggio was gotten out of office. And even before, Mario did many things to to undo some of the some of the uh, the uh, the nominations that Baggio had made in cardinals and bishops in Latin America, Marini actually undid them. Uh, papal nuncios also, until he had worthy people placed in situations that were going to do well for the church. So, where are we? That's the situation. Marini, Mario Marini in Rome and Jorge Bergoglio became friends. Uh, Marini would, uh, would take him out uh, to dinner, always paid for his cab fare back to his hotel because he never had any money. Uh, he, he told us that too. He said, he said, can you imagine a man coming to, to a city like this, uh, being the Archbishop, Archbishop of Buenos Aires without any money in his pocket, enough for a, a, a cab, a, a, a taxi. So he took him to dinner, but also had to pay that. It's there's something I've met a few people like this. And Liz, maybe I think I think you and I were talking about this one day. Uh, th there's a type of, of, of religious or, par or or clergy that live this poverty. They live it through you. You pay for everything. <laughs> that's that's their idea of poverty. It's as long as they don't pay for it. You know, you know. there was a story that I remember of St. Francis of Assisi who never touched money. Mm. He just he didn't want to even touch money, right? This is why they take him as the patron of the patron of the poor. But 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 whenever anybody would come with a donation of money or something, he said, uh, "See Brother Leone here. He takes yeah. care of the money." Yeah, <laughs> right? that's it's it's that kind of a thing. So anyway, uh, what what would they discuss? Um, they discussed uh, this. Father Bergoglio, Cardinal Bergoglio, told Mario that he too 
was deeply concerned for theology of liberation. He hated it. He detested it. It had to be finished. And he wanted to, to uproot it in the society of Jew, uh, the Did I say the society of Judas? <laughs> I meant to say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that. I meant to say the society of Jesus. I really oh, you're did. getting yourself in big trouble. For I, I, I'm, I'm getting it. No, no, I'm already there. I'm already there. It's, I, I, you know, but there's an old, there's an old military saying that when you're in so deep, just keep digging because yeah. it's got, you've got to come out the other side, right? Keep anyway, digging, Father. That's, I'm going to keep digging. Anyway, he, he told us, he told this other priest and myself that, that, uh, that Bergoglio was uh, against the liberals in the church. Uh, he considered himself a traditionalist. He was, and he was against communism, against uh, socialism, and against the theology of liberation. He had no time for any of these things. They were destroying society and the church. Um, he wanted to protect marriage. At that time, he, he, he and Mario had a discussion about what was happening to marriage, the attack on marriage in Argentina. Uh, he was very upset that, that, that uh, this was happening, uh, very upset by the, by the promotion of the last, I can't remember her name, it was a, a woman president of Argentina, I believe, who Virtual. was pushing, Virtual. yes. Yeah. But even before that, they were pushing, they were pushing for homosexual uh, marriage. Uh, and uh, uh, Bergoglio was absolutely against this. A marriage was between a man and a woman. That's how it was. Anything else is off the table. Um, something else that, that Mario said that was, that I found kind of interesting because Mario Marini was not a man given to gossip. He didn't like gossip. He found that he found that a lot of priests were were into gossiping about one another and, and things in the church. Mario Marini was interested on your theology. He was interested on your philosophy. He was interested <laughs> where you stood, where you were working, what you were doing in in matters of the faith. He didn't want to know. Uh, uh, who said this and who bit that one and who 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 said this? All, all of those things disturbed him. He had no time for those things. He found that Bergoglio was very interested in all those things and wanted to know about every member of the Roman Curia that way. <laughs> right? This is this mm -hmm. is this is exactly what he told us. Uh, I would I guess Mar Mario's very good friends in the in the the Roman Curia were. Uh, uh, Mark Willette of the Congregation for Bishops, very close friends. They were be before he became a bishop. Uh, Dario Castrione, Arenzi, Sarah, and Ratzinger himself. Mm -hmm. It was Mario Marini who brought to Ratzinger's attention uh, uh, quite vociferously, he went over and saw him, uh, the lack of, uh, of address. They did not address the, the question of Freemasons in the new code of canon law. And it was Mario Marini who brought that to Ratzinger's attention and Ratzinger immediately got on it, took care of it because he, he understood that it was important. Um, something happened, now, again, the last, the last time I sat down and had dinner with Mario was in, in 2007. He died in 2009 uh, and didn't tell anybody that he was sick. Even his, I think even his family, he just, he just had one person who took care of wounds and, but, but no, that was not him. Uh, the, something happened after the 2005 election of Ratzinger, because he told me, uh, this is before, before the, the election came up, he said, there are two candidates for the, for the next for the next election for Pope. And one is Ratzinger and the other one is Bergoglio. Said that, and I said, who is Bergoglio? I remember asking, who is Bergoglio? I've never heard of him. That's how we got into all of the conversation. And he, he described he described these things that I just told you about him. Uh, something happened in the 2005 election because after that, Mario met with him but did not have the same confidence in him. He started taking a distance from him. And that was it. Uh, when he was, then he was elected, he was elected Pope Mario never lived long enough to see that. 
but a delegation, a delegation from uh, from Gervia, Ravenna, came to see Bergoglio after he was elected pope, and they they of, of course said uh, one of their 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 favorite sons was Mario Marini, Monsignor Mario Marini, and uh, Pope Francis said he said to the to the group he said I just want to tell you that when news came to me of the death of Monsignor Mario Marini, he said, it was one of the saddest days of my life that I had to live hearing that news. Well, what am I telling you in all of this? Uh, I think I'm telling you that there's, 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 there's something wrong here. There's something wrong here. Uh, I, this man, did not seem to be truthful in his climb up. It just didn't seem that way. Liz, about a year ago or so, you were talking about Peronism mm -hmm. right, as, a, as, a, as a political philosophy, and not just in Latin America, but anywhere. And yeah. it, it's basically tell everyone yes. Yeah. Tell everyone yes. Whatever whatever anyone wants to hear, say yes. Perón was famous for this. He could meet with the communists and say yes to them. He could meet yeah. with the industrialists five minutes later. Yes. Everything was yes. And everyone loved him because they all believed him. Right. I think we're dealing with something very much like that here. I really do. Um well, Father, you're confirming something that Henry Sire wrote in his book, I believe. It was that um, Jorge Bergoglio, before he became, while he was bishop and cardinal, he had planted people in the Vatican. Um, he wanted to know who who were the power centers, who had information, um, and it sounds very much like he was pumping Marini for information. Um, that's exactly, Liz. That's exactly what I'm telling you. That's exactly what he was saying. Yes. And, and the other thing is, is that remember when he met with Vigano and Vigano said the first thing he asked me or one of the things he said is, what do you know about McCarrick? And he was always interested in finding out because, you know, the, McCarrick was the bellwether, right? If you were against McCarrick, uh, then yes. off with your yes. head, which which happened very quickly with um Archbishop Vigano. Um, and I think that's precisely what he was doing. He was pumping for information because even Kolvenbach, the Jesuit superior general, talks about uh, Bergoglio's in the Kolvenbach report of um, really urging him not to become a bishop, said that he was devious. Um, he was into power, <clears throat> into power. All these things are what you're saying, and it seems to me that this scenario that you described was played out shortly um, after the conclave. Remember the news media? They all said, oh, he's against liberation theology. Oh, and we all took a deep breath. Oh, thank goodness. He's against liberation theology. Yes. And he's um, uh, he's a conservative. That was another yes. lot that came out. Yes. Um, and, and since then, of course, you know, I've read your book. I real I have to tell people it is just it's it's part thriller. It's a part, part insider into the Vatican. I mean, my mind was opened up about Freemasonry. It's just fascinating read. And you know, it's inter You say in the book, Father, that Monsignor Marini was um, highly esteemed by John Paul II and by Ratzinger. They both Absolutely. respected him. And, you, you know, you did just described a scene where he was like, yeah, I'm not playing politics in the Vatican. I'm just going to do my job. I don't have to be seen by the Pope. Um, the, he was one of the few. Um, true. Um, and, yeah. and, and it happens to be true, Liz. <laughs> Seriously. He had no time. He had no time for show. This was he saw what was happening to the church. He knew what was happening. And he did his best in his entire lifetime to stop things, to promote good things, to to uh, to cancel bad things. He really did. And so what did Bergoglio do when he became pope? He invited Leonardo Buff, one of the head liberation theologians in South America who pushed for decades liberation theology. He spoke mm -hmm. once or twice at the Vatican. Um, 
uh, Father Gutierrez, same thing. I mean, these are yes. men who have written books on liberation theology about Father, Gut Father Gutierrez didn't didn't only write a book; he was the father of liberation theology, yeah. right? And in Boff's book, Boff's book, Cry of the Earth, Cry of the Poor. I mean, you read Laudate C, si, you read any of the yeah. speeches of Francis. It's straight out of these guys. In fact, they talk about Pachamama, you know, the the mother <laughs> deity. This is the, you know, the, the pagan god. So in and all these guys had been, you know, Ratzinger had gone after them when he was at the CDF. Um, and I know one of them was silenced. Um, and they were resurrected, <clears throat> like McCarrick, like so many others, by by Bergoglio when he became pope. Um, so this is so interesting that he put on this facade, this lie, this deception, whatever. Um, and because in America, and I'm sure, I'm sure, Father, in Italy, in Rome, at the Vatican, you know, liberation theology was like waving a red flag and he wanted to tamp down any rumors right that may have reached rome um so that you know it's um and we all thought you had, you know, with with liberation theology you had cardinal ratzinger himself yeah was in charge of that ratzinger had silenced uh boff mm -hmm. uh, i was i was with ratzinger i was with ratzinger and there's another there are two other priests there are two other priests who are still alive who can testify to this I, I presented uh, two Monsignori from the United States, from New York, to Ratzinger, right? And Ratzinger had to cut the, the audience short. He, he was with them for about 20 minutes. He had to cut the audience with us. Uh, he had to cut it short because he had Father Gutierrez waiting in the, yeah. in the, in the waiting room. And we walked right by him. And I, I said, good luck. Yes. <laughs> good luck. Yeah. And, and, but but they had no time for this. What they were trying to do was, and you and remember, remember something. Theology of liberation came out of Germany. It did well, not come out of Latin America. It came out of Germany. This is a whole political religious theor, a thesis that what that was born out of Germany. The Germans are very fond of creating things and then sending them to other places to be experimented upon. Well, Father, you know, there's a book called Disinformation written by mm -hmm. Ron Wilczek and this Romanian KGB defector um, by yes. the name of Lieutenant General uh, Pasipa. And Pasipa claims that liberation theology, and he goes into great detail, it's a fascinating book, about liberation theology was created by the KGB to undermine and bring down the Catholic Church and to create division, chaos, civil wars in Latin America. And they they literally sent people into uh, Latin America and it became, their project of liberation theology became wildly successful. Um, they implanted it both in the Catholic church primarily, but also in the evangelical uh, churches and the World Council of Churches. And so this was in the, I think, Father, you'd correct me, 1970s or so, and it took off. And it impacted- Libera Liber Liberation oh, Theology, yeah. the book Liberation Theology by Gustavo Gutierrez came out in 1971. Yeah. Gustavo Gutierrez came to the, the, uh, the Mexican college, I believe in 1973, 1973 or 1974, and gave a conference there. He was the one who mentioned that philosophically, the philosophical base of theology of liberation was German. Mm. That's that, that's why I'm repeating it. Yeah, I, I remember well, being being I remember being being a little bit taken aback by that. Well, because you know, I thought I thought it was coming. It was it was you know it was it was uh, organically coming out of Latin America. No, 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 no. It was, no, no, no. Well, you know, and I, I also it. think they're very sensitive. The liberation theologians are very sensitive about this allegation that has now been proven that it was fomented, created, and implanted in Latin America by the Soviets. So they want to disabuse anybody of that notion that this is a Soviet propaganda um, movement to undermine Christianity. And, um, you know, Pasipa's book is very, you know, very detailed about the propaganda of 
liberation theology and how wildly successful it was. Well, so, it, it certainly it certainly was successful. Yeah. So here's and destroying. one of the one of the upshots of what you're saying, Father, is it's very um, concerning, but also very revealing. Concerning because um, it involves an intentional false representation. If we know that uh, Pope Francis not only um, doesn't hate um, liberation theology, to such an extent that, that um, Leonardo Bob called one of his um, writing yes. uses him so much. Um, if he's so enamored with Gutierrez as, as he is, and he's basically resurrected all of the the liberation theologians that were not quite deep six, but you know what I mean, theologically moved by uh, Pope's John Paul II and Benedict. Something's very wrong. It was a misrepresentation of himself. It's just stunning. Um, but it also... And, 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 and John Henry, if I may add to what you're saying, I absolutely agree. He re it, it's obvious that he represented himself in another way. He did not represent himself for what he, what he is, what he turned out to be. Uh, this, this was intentional. This is intentional. And, and I'm going to tell you something else. To have fooled Monsignor Mario Marini, who grew up surrounded by Marxism and communism in the north of Italy, mm -hmm. understood it very well and suffered deeply. To have fooled Monsignor Mario Marini, that's a good one. That's a good one. I mean, you, you had to be very good, a very good actor to do that. And he did. He did. Marini caught on to him before he died. But the, the yes. Yes. Oh, that oh, that Marini could have explained that to the cardinals. But I guess how do you do that? Because this lets the public understand something of the election of Pope Francis, because there was a lot of good cardinals. Yes. How in the world did they? Jorge Bergoglio, if his past was known, if he was known to be a super controversial guy with regard to marriage open to same-sex civil unions, which were uh, not, which were totally forbidden before, um, would come to the brink of, um, you know, blessing for uh, people in divorce, remarriage, and not living in continence. If all of that was out there on the agenda, if it was no, the, he wouldn't have got anywhere near election to... No, uh, no, you can be sure. And yet there's a very, very different picture presented. You can be sure, you can be sure. The, the conclave would not have voted for that. Uh, look, what's happening right now, the reaction right now, you're not hearing completely because the cardinals are not speaking. Many bishops are not speaking. Uh, it is wrong to interpret that as them being in agreement with what's happening. I believe the majority are not in agreement. I believe this is being done by a minority. And I think you're going to see that in the next conclave. However, he did not present himself. He was not forthright in his presentation of himself, to be, to be sure. I had, a, I had a great aunt who was a, a marvelous woman. She was a secretary to a judge. And she always got, she always got two, uh, two sayings mixed up. One of the sayings was, uh, if if so and so were alive today, he'd die again, right? And the other saying was, he's got to be spinning in his grave. But she put them both together, and she said, if so and so were alive today, he'd be spinning in his grave. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but and with all, and I told you, Mario Marini had a great sense of humor, and I know he's listening to me right now. Mario Marini would be spinning in his grave. Right now, if he saw if he saw the reality of this, he already before he died, doubted, he doubted even then. But if he would see the re this reality, this would be outrageous, outrageous. Yeah. And, it, and in a way, and in a way, I'm I'm in a, in a way, I'm glad that he's not here now. In this sense, I miss him terribly. He was, he was my father. He was my older brother. He was everything. However, uh, I can speak. He couldn't speak. Even if this was happening right now, he would he would work to finish it, but he wouldn't be able to speak. 
uh, this, these things had to be, had to be known. And, and, uh, I battled with it. I battled with it. And I say, as, as, as a, as a light that, that said, yes, was the, the arrival of this priest last week uh, that we hadn't seen each other for years. And we, I introduced him to Mario. They, they became very close friends as the three of us were. And he said, Oh, absolutely. He said this, that, and the other. I said, great. Okay. So I'm not, I'm not, uh, I have something to stand to back me up, someone to, to back me up on this. And yes. But, well, you know, fa you Father and John Henry, just look at the recent comments of um, Bergoglio regarding praising communism. He said, he said, communists stole some of our Christian values. Mm -hmm. He said, if anything, it is the communists who think like Christians. Um, he, I believe he said, I'm a communist and so is Jesus. Um, he, he has um, praised China, the brutal, genocidal communist dictatorship. He's you know, praised Cuba, Evo, Evo Morales, um, the you know, murderous dictator of Bolivia, has been invited um, to the Vatican a number of times. Um, even, you know, even the president the new president of uh, Millet. Marxist crucifix from Eva Morales. Yes, yes. yes, yes. And even Millet, Javier Millet, calls him, calls him a communist. He's been absolutely silent about the genocide of the Uyghurs in China, about the brutality of faithful Catholics in China. Um, and, you know, he often says, I've met many Marxists in my life who are good people, so I don't feel offended if I'm called a Marxist. So, you know, Father, what you're saying is, is that now that the, now that he's firmly ensconced, he's come out of his, of hiding, hasn't he? And we, those of us who've read his many biographies remember that his most um, dearest mentor was his boss, Esther Cariaga, who was a firm, fervent communist, um, and he regards her as her his most important mentor. He owes a great deal um, to this woman, and in fact, she taught him a lot about politics. So you know this. <laughs> what he oh, was, and of course, and he, and he hid all of her Marxist communist books um, from you know from the government. He hid them in his library. Um, she was ultimately arrested by the junta and killed. Um, but and and he buried her in a Catholic cemetery, although she apparently was not a Catholic or did not certainly didn't believe in Catholicism. Um, so you know, there's a pattern not only of his behavior now, but also a pattern of his um, comments that are becoming more and more pro-communist. Um, and um, so you know what he what he said to Marini was, um, you know, unfortunately, I think uh, he was being decept deceptive and, and also, I think, um, really trying to pump Marini for as much information as he could get. You know, politics is who you know, right? To be sure, to be sure. But, but, my, but my point in this, and I've, I've said it once, but let me say it again, to have, if you knew Mario Marini, to have fooled him, <laughs> You have to be pretty good. I'll tell you, you have to be pretty good and pretty convincing. And he did fool him. He did fool him. Mm -hmm. Well, here's something, though. Aren't we watching that same deception play out before yep. our eyes? Yes. Yes. Because let's look just at the current crisis over food. Mm -hmm. Here we have you know, craft ambiguous document that talks about blessing same-sex couples, but in the same breath, it says how, oh, it's not same-sex marriage, we can't bless same-sex marriage, blah, blah, blah. The whole wide world knows it. But Francis does two things. Today, even, he says, I am blessing people who love each other. Wait a minute, what love is he talking about? He's talking about homosexual. And then what kind of... Um, and can you really describe that as well? when they're harming each other. But nonetheless, he's playing up to an audience. But that whole audience outside the church, all the LGBT activists, most of the regular world, who aren't steeped in Catholic theology, who aren't the bishops and aren't faithful Catholics trying to square the circle, they totally understand what they're doing. Because they watch him do it. They have no question 
this is a step toward same-sex marriage, acknowledging, accepting homosexuality. They all do that. Why? Because Christ is approved by his actions. If you have a consistent pattern of activity that shows you how you should interpret the document, you might say it's a hermeneutic of fiducia supplicants, a la Francis. What has he done? Well, he met with um, the nun of the trans who ha welcomes poor trans people into her home and lets them live together as couples, and Francis backs her. Francis, remember, when he came to America, what did he do? Yeah. He, because Vigano had Kim Davison, who was that Protestant clerk from Kentucky who refused to sign a same certificate because she was a Christian, Francis met with her at the behest of Vigano and then told uh, one Carlos Cruz, one of the sexual abuse victims, was a homosexual activist, that he fired Vigano because he invited Kim Davis to come and speak with him. And the Vatican even reacted, because I'm sure Bergoglio was really angry that that happened, the Vatican reacted by refusing to acknowledge the, inter the, the meeting with Kim Davis, and they said the, the, that the nuncio arranged that the only official meeting that the Pope had was with his former student in his family. And who was his former student? It was Yalo Grassi. Yalo Grassi came, yes, with his family, his brother, uh, excuse me, his sister and his mother, but also with his homosexual lover, by the way. And <laughs> Francis can be seen embracing only Yayo Grassi, his mother and his sister, and also his homosexual lover. And then the number one homosexual promoting priest in America, everybody knows his name, Father James Martin. The Pope meets with him regularly, had him speak at a Vatican conference, put him on a pontificate, and write private handwritten letters to him, not for private, for public, of how great his work is. Remember Sister Janine Gremmick, who was sanctioned under JP2 for her new yes. ministry work, which yeah. uh, allowed homosexuality except homosexual sex. Pope Francis writes about her in This is a reversal of the church's teaching against sodomy. And yet, how can some bishops, how can some people wonder what Francis means in fiducia supplicants? The whole rest of the world doesn't. The homosexual activists are celebrating for good reason. And the world is putting them on the cover of magazines, gay magazines included, because everybody knows where he's going. And oh, yes. it's only that very small number of Catholic bishops and Catholic priests and Catholic faithful feel they have to do mental gymnastics to get out of the horrific realization of what Francis is. Um, that they have to strain their brains to say, no, 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 it can't be that. And yet every bit of evidence says it is. I don't know how I don't know how someone can look at the 11 years of this pontificate and not come to to see the reality. Uh, some just don't want to. Some were educated in a in a way that it just they they just can't they can't bring themselves to 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 seeing this. Uh, it was hard for all of us. I, I should add to those people. It was hard for all of us to go through that and come to the conclusion that uh, that that something is very wrong. Something is rotten in Denmark. Uh, just you know th that reversal. John Henry, that you were talking about. You know, this for years, he claimed his opinions were to the contrary. And this is what he presented to everybody. If he presented it to Mario Marini, which he did, he also presented it to a number of people I know in the Vatican. And I'm sure he did. Uh, wow. Wow. <laughs> That's 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 pretty amazing. Today, uh, actually, actually, it was kind of ironic. The same priest who was here before, uh, who had, had had been uh, together with with Mario and myself and heard all of these things that Mario said, uh, sent me a, a thing where, where he, the Pope called us hypocrites. Mm -hmm. All right now, look. I'll admit to hypocrisy every once in a while in my life. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I admit to that. But not on this. Not on this. Because what he said is this. What he said was this. Uh, he said, priests 
have a pretty easy life. Agio in Italian, a very easy, pretty easy life. The people in the world suffer, but the clergy has, a, has an easy time of it. Uh, they would bless individuals who have taken advantage of people in business, who have cheated, uh, who have stolen pe from people, this, that, and the other thing. It, it, that's the, the uh, implication anyway. Those people they would bless, that man who, would, who had robbed his employees and everything else, they would bless that person, but they would not bless a homosexual. He said, this is hypocrisy. Just a moment, just a moment. <laughs> I, for one, have blessed any number of homosexuals <laughs> and heterosexuals and people excommunicated, not excommunicated, but living outside of the uh, outside of the the, the, the the state of grace. Let me put it this way. In second and third marriages, I've asked for a blessing. I, I ask that the blessing bring them back to God before they die. You know, yes, that's the sort of blessing. This is not what he's talking about. What people, what priests are refusing to go along with is blessing a union. But he twists, everything is confused. The, his language is confused. And you've got this, this, this pious old man sitting there looking like, why don't these people understand me? I'm just asking for things to be, you know, to, for all of us to, can't we all get along? Who was the guy who said that in Los Angeles? King, right? Can't we all just get along? You know, it's yeah. that kind of, no. No, he presents it. The, the language is mixed up. The, it's 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 convoluted. Everything is changed. Nothing is straightforward. Everything he loves confusion, mm -hmm. and this is the whole, this is the whole thing. N none of these seeds could be have could could have, these seeds of chaos could have been sown other than in fertilized confusion. Oh, look, look, he, taken, he, you, you, you wouldn't get away with it if, we, if you were speaking straight, straightforward. You couldn't. It has to be. It's again, I've said this many times before. Two steps forward, three back, four forward, th back and forth, back and forth. And finally, it doesn't matter what you say because we, we're on to something new now. Next. Yeah. This it, it, what a what a somebody's somebody's going to do doctoral thesis on this. They really are. This is well, a whole new this is a whole new genre of political get whatever you want. No, it's a, a psychological uh, thesis on on him, Father. Yeah, that's also, that's what they're gonna, that's what they're going to do. And look, look, he's a Jesuit. He's playing these linguistic games. Um, he's getting tremendous global heat from the church, from respected um, theologians bishops and cardinals, not enough, certainly. Um, and this is, you know, when he starts gaslighting, right? When he starts gaslighting, then you know you're making headway with him because he is, um, he's getting desperate. And yes. he's playing these, you know, linguistic lies that, you know, have been his tried and true for his entire career. That's why he's sitting in, you know, where he's sitting. Um, and and to me, it's like, you know, don't insult my intelligence. You know, stop, stop trashing good, holy people who love the church and are faithful to the church. I mean, this week he again went after traditional Catholics who were criticizing this, saying, you know, what are their sacristy Christians or something? You know, it just yeah. it's unbelievable. But first of all, he's not going to silence us. Number two, unlike the Vatican press corps, we are not going to be um, so, um, I guess, reverent in and cover up and protect his uh, the delicate scandals that are in the Vatican. This is about the truth. And about the truth, we are not going to fudge. We're not going to play word games. We're not going to deceive. We are going to speak truth to power. And that's what the Catholic Church has done. The Catholic Church did it, you know, in the 70s and 80s when they went to these UN con uh, conferences on population, and you know, in the Catholic Church spoke truth, and one by one, other countries joined them so that they right. could defeat the communist 
population control murderous UN. In fact, at one, I think it was at the Cairo conference, um, all the liberal feminist women went out and got buttons made saying, I'm poped out because, because the Pope had been so um, strong and vociferous in, um, in insisting on the dignity of the unborn and the dignity of women. Um, and so, look, um, this is, we're, we're going to see very quickly um, that he, as he tries to tamp down, as he tries to uh, distract and shift the blame to those people that are criticizing him, we're going to see in the next year, buckle up Catholics, we're going to see um, changes um, in women in ministry. We're going to see continued changes in theology and in dogma. And I think that's those of us who, who signed the letter saying rescind fiducia supplicants. Um, those of us who signed it, many, you know, people a lot smarter than I am, theologians, you know, a few priests, and um, I think Bishop Strickland also, is we have had enough. For God's sake, step up and stop this um, deception this destruction of the Catholic Church. I know the Church is suffering its crucifixion and was predicted in Marian prophecy, but we are also required to speak truth to power and not to be intimidated by a tyrant who name calls or threatens or cancels or um, cancels contracts, rental agreements. Um, we must stand up and speak. And so, you know, I think um, when I see him gaslighting like this, I think we're making progress. We're making progress. I think so. I think you're right, Liz. I think you're right. I think you're right. There's a the the reaction. The reaction is not one of a man who's who's uh, who's confident of what he's doing. No, indeed, it's one of the things we have to we have to stress for people. This can't be about being afraid. Let's go back to John Paul II, who told us from the, his beginning, don't be afraid. We can't, he set us up for this time in, in that respect. We can't be afraid of what we're facing in the world or unfortunately from evil forces within the church because Christ is still with us. And we have to have that confidence. It's a confidence to speak out. Some might even think foolishly, um, you know, how many times have I been told... How, how are you speaking about this? You're in Canada, after all. We have to have the confidence in Christ and in his truth and go forward as the Holy Spirit calls us, sometimes to prudence, of course, but very often to speak out. Um, that actually brings us to another major topic. The um, liberals have threatened to go after uh, conservatives in their homes and in their churches should Trump be elected. Liz, you have those details for us. Yes. I mean, we'll all recall um, during the leaked decision, um, uh, the Dobbs decision, the abortion, overturning Roe versus Wade. Um, in fact, they never did find the person. I think it was just about 30 people they had to interview. That person was never identified by the FBI who um, illegally um, leaked the decision prior to its release from the Supreme Court. Um, but as a result of that leaking, it was game on with the radical left, the leftists, who um, literally day after day, night after night, um, marched, terrorized um, the Supreme Court justices, the five um, conservative justices who overturned Roe versus Wade. In fact, you may recall that um, the police arrested a man right by Justice Kavanaugh's house who intended to um, kill Kavanaugh and his family, yes. Justice Kavanaugh. Uh, the same type of people are now threatening um, Heritage Foundation's Project 2025. Um, going, they're saying they're going to go after conservatives at their homes, at their churches. Well, I guess they'll be joining the um, FBI at the Latin Mass. Um, <laughs> and they'll be going to places, people where they work, to harass them and intimidate them. See, this is mob rule. This is what happens when the rule of law is not 
imposed and not made effective in our culture. And we were seeing that time and time again. And so brute force, who is going to use brute force and how can we cancel, intimidate people into being silent? Um, we're going to see more and more of this. Look, we knew we know that these organizations are fun, funded by Soros and by the, the radical left. Um, and they're you know highly organized. Um, this has been we probably will anticipate this um, during the election in order to intimidate people um, into not voting. Um, but this this is the reality um, of what exists right now. Um, Catholics, I think, are really very much going to be um, in the um, target zone of these crazy radical radicals. You know, I grew up seeing, you know, the radicals in the 60s, you know, the, the pipe bombers um, uh, burning down buildings. Um, we've seen how nearly every one of our major cities have been um, really abandoned because of crime, because of the the dumping of you know millions of illegals uh, who have crossed into the border are just taking over hotels, taking over schools. Um, it's this is the deconstruction of our civilization, and um, now they're going to go directly at us at individuals at conservatives um i think you know we're going to have to stand strong um that's why we have saint michael that's why we have the rosary that's why you know the atlantic magazine the liberal atlantic magazine said the rosary is the conservatives um you know ak uh 15 ak 50 you know that's you know they understand the power that we have um but we better use it and um, because uh, they're going to try and intimidate with brute force. Um, let me just, on that score, let's put in a plug for the Knights of John Paul II, an amazing movement uh, of, um, basically it's a men's group. They meet once a week uh, outside their local church and pray in twos open carry, carrying the rosary around town, praying, circling, uh, you know, the, the city center or town center. And, uh, you know, their major, uh, whatever it is, their churches and so on. Um, beautiful program to take back your cities and towns for, and your families, uh, for Christ and his Holy Mother. Uh, go to the Knights, uh, excuse me, knightsofjohnpaul2.com for more information. Father, last word over to you. How can people uh, living in this time still not be afraid when there is so much arrayed against them? You know this, of course, that, that, that I was a very good friend of, uh, of Mother Pasqualina, Pius XII's personal secretary. I asked her one time, uh, in my own confusion, I guess I was 24, 25 years old, and uh, I had my own, Mario Marini was my spiritual director and my confessor, right? However, I always, in my life, all through my life, I always had an older woman in my life. I, I appreciated the counsel, the advice, the wisdom. It was coming from a different place. It wasn't like the men that I, that I talked to always. It was from a different place, and I liked that. I liked her very much, her, her approach to everything. And I asked her one time, I said, you know, what I was taught, and I was taught not just in school, I was taught by family. We lived this. We lived our Catholic faith. Mm -hmm. It's all being challenged today. This is 1974. I said, it's all being challenged today. And I said, what I'm hearing at that time from the Jesuits at the Gregorian, some of them, not all of them, some, the majority were great professors, but there were a few lunatics. <laughs> so what, I, what, what I'm hearing is contrary to what I heard before. I said, somebody is lying. Are they lying to me today or were they lying yesterday? And she looked right at me and she said, they were lying to you yesterday. Excuse me, they're lying to you today. They were not lying to you yesterday. 
you learned the faith, you had the faith, you got the faith, hold on to it. That's the truth. What you're hearing today are lies, right? I've, I've maintained that through life. I've maintained that through life. What I know, what I, what I, what I was taught, what I lived, that was the truth. It is the truth. Uh, and I think this, I, I, I've said this to people on any time I get a chance to speak to anybody, because everyone that I've come in contact with, even liberals, are, are, are not happy. <laughs> there's, there's, there's something wrong with the whole thing, with the whole picture. I just keep telling them the following. Stay with what you know, what you were taught. The faith of the ages hasn't changed a bit. As nothing has changed. Our doctrines have not changed. What we believe has not changed. Nothing. Stay with it. Pray. And you have to know that the church has been in dire situations in 2,000 years, in very dire situations during its history. We've always come out rather well. And we're going to come out rather well from this. What is being, what is, I, I see what's happening today. Everything is being put in question. Everything is under examination. Everything is under a microscope. Everything is being questioned. Well, all of those questions are going to be reaffirmed and re-answered dynamically, strong, strong, strong in the future. In the, and we hope and pray in the not too distant future. Uh, but it's going to happen. It's going to happen. One last thing, one last thing, a piece of a piece of, of of counsel from Mario Marini. We used to we used to walk uh, uh, in the evenings, some many times in St. Peter's Square, and it was wonderful because it was, it was, it was there were different times. It was quiet, and he said, Charlie, look at that edifice. You know what it means to you. I know what it means to me. We know what it means to each other. He said, Can you imagine? that the people who dug the foundations for St. Peter's Basilica never saw even one fourth of the building done. Yeah. And these great cathedral, the, the people who built the, who dug the foundations never saw anything yep. completed really. Right. But if it weren't for them, the edifice was never finished. Mm -hmm. That's what we have to look at in the church. We're here not to see the final product. That's not that's not ours to see. That's God's. We'll see it one day. We'll see it one day. Oh, and a magnificent view we'll have of the final product. Right now, we're being asked to play our part in putting back together the Catholic Church that's been dismantled for the last 60 years, at least, even longer, but strongly in the last 60 years. Do your part to keep it together. And that's it. That's God's plan. Uh, I wish we were all born in different times. I wish these were other times and they were nicer and we would all get together and things were lovely, but they're not. They're not. That only happens in heaven. So let's all struggle hard. Do your best to get to heaven. That's the whole point. That's the whole point. That's why we're here. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Liz, so very much. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for joining us on this, our first live edition of Faith and Reason. We hope to see you here next time. And please let us know in the comments what you thought. God bless you.